Um, welcome. My name is Jeff Wilson, and I'm the founder and um, chairman of Wilson Asset Management and uh, a number of our investment companies. Look, thank you all for coming. A as you know, um, we are, you know, we've just had the annual general meetings of all our listed investment companies, and we are only on those boards, um, and we are the fund managers of those entities because you, know, you allow us to do that. So um, you know what we like doing is we like communicating with shareholders as much as we can um, and on a regular basis giving you an update. And of course today is our six monthly update. In terms of numbers, you know, it's, a, it's a record number. I'm not sure if that means we're close to the top of the market or, or, or what that means. I'll be giving you the first part of the presentation uh, and then I'll pass over to our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Stott, and, and the rest of the team will take you through um, the presentation, the rest of the presentation today. So that's the disclaimer. If you can quickly read that, uh, then, then that, that means you can't sue us. So, 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 so where are we you know, in terms of the market? You know, what's, what's my view of the market or what's our, as an organisation, view of the market? You know, um, we've got the words up there, all bull markets end. Now this is the, you know, this, this bull market's been going for eight years and eight months in the US. It's the third longest bull market ever. You know, 104 months the market's been going up without a 20% correction in the US. The, the longest bull market ever went for 150 months. The second longest is 111 months. Um, so all, all, all I know is that we're in the mature stages of the bull market. Now, in terms of, we've got a lot of people that invested in the market here. Like, how do you all feel in terms of, forget what you feel about what's happening going forward, and I know we're always nervous or worried, but in terms of your ability to, to make money over the last period of time, put up your hand if you're feeling you know, it's pretty good or it's you know, in terms of being able to make money. Anyone who's... Yeah. To, to me, in theory, um, because we've been in a bull market, it seems... You know, it seems to be have been reasonably easy, particularly this uh, uh, you know, last little period. And, and where are we in the market? Um, you know, or what's driving the market? We've got synchronised global growth. We've got uh, a 30-year bull market in bonds. So we've got interest rates at record low levels, which have expanded price earnings ratios. Um, and we've got really no signs that uh, wages are growing globally. We've got no signs of that, so no signs of inflation, um, and so no signs that interest rates are going up. So the environment, and we've got record low volatility. So the environment is, is very good as an investor. Now the question is, how long will that last? Um, and and th that, unfortunately, I can't answer you. Now, unfortunately, our crystal ball doesn't tell us that. You know, all I do know is we're in the mature stages of the bull market, so with, if you're an investor, then, then be wary. Um, you know, have have a, a reasonable amount of cash in your portfolio, you know, so you're well positioned when things change. It doesn't look as though they're going to change in the, in the short term, but we know the bull markets don't go on forever. Um, so I think it's worthwhile just being aware of that. Now what I'd like to do is just... Um, we look at the next slide. Now, with this slide, I'll take you across the top. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of macro themes or mega themes that are, are worthwhile um, focusing on. Because as investment professionals, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to buy undervalued growth companies. And we try to buy them before we can see a catalyst that's going to change the valuation and we get that uplift. Otherwise, we, we sit in cash. Um, now, in terms of trying to find those undervalued growth companies, we've got to be aware of what's happening with, around the world. You know, we've got to be incredibly inquisitive. Um, and we do that by meeting as many companies as we can. You know, we've got eight investment professionals and, and we have over 1,500 company meetings a year. So we're trying to collect information all the time. Um, now, in terms of these big trends, the, up in the top left, you know, the economy of the future, what will the economy of the future be? You could argue we're in the fourth industrial revolution. You know, that's where we are. 
I mean, who's going to be driving the world? You know, we think we're driving the world. You know, all the, you know, I just snuck into the baby boomer area, but um, there's a lot of baby boomers here. We think we're driving the world, but no, we're not. So the millennials, in 10 years' time, the millennials will be uh, 75% of the global workforce. So they are the ones that will be shaping the world uh, for us going forward. And, and what is a millennial? You know, in terms of it, it's tough on the definition. Broadly, they say people born between you know, uh, 1980-ish and, and just under 2000 in that period. Um, but, and who are the millennials? The, you know, they are highly educated. A third of them have gone to university, uh, had university degrees. Interesting, Generation Z, which comes after the millennials, that's the sort of 95 to the uh, 2005. You know, 50% of those have gone to university. Secondly, you know, they are, so they're highly educated. They are, the millennials are very digital. You, know, you could argue they're digital natives. Um, and they're very, um, you know, they're very focused on social responsibility. Um, you know, is, is a very big area of focus. So you, you just, we just have to be aware of that significant trend. Obviously, for the baby boomers, if we go down to the bottom left, you'll be healthier for longer. We're sort of, yeah, you know, with a bit of luck, we get enough of that. Um, you know, the incredible thing is, you know, at the moment, I think the age expectancy is, you know, this year was 82 years of age or, you know, just a little over. Um, someone who has been born today is going to live till 150. So, and, and, in, and, and in 10 or 20 years' time, you'll be talking about living till 110 to 120. So how people will be looking at the world then, they won't be looking at, you know, they won't be thinking of the day as a 24-hour clock. They'll be thinking, as Jim Mellon, you know, well, put it at the Sone conference uh, last week, they'll be, the other week, they'll be thinking of a 36-hour clock. You know, you'll have that much more time. So what does that mean? Uh, and then how do you position yourself to benefit from that? Uh, and, and to me, you know, that's going to be one of the trends, you know, longevity. Um, and it won't just be, um, it'll actually be not, not just re, you know, stopping ageing, but it'll be reversing ageing. And they talk about in 20 years' time, you know, we'll have cures for cancer. So the world is going to change significantly. And, and the fascinating thing in terms of the world changing is the line between computers and humans is going to be totally blurred. You know, the, the interesting thing is that in, in 10 years' time, or actually 20 years' time, that 70 to 80% of the current jobs of today will, 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 won't exist. I mean, one of the interesting things is um, that 90% of lawyers won't have jobs. Now, that's right, everyone, everyone says that. <laughs> um, so, to me, it, it's just, so how do you position yourself and, and what does this mean? And, of course, you know, with that, um, you know, the blurring of the lines, you know, I know I've got an iPhone and I try to talk to Siri. Unfortunately, Siri doesn't, never understands what I'm saying, unless I'm swearing at her. And then she always says, don't say that. Um, and, 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 I mean, you know, I've been to the US three times in the last 12 months, uh, and talk to the people over there about the, the sort of the Amazon equivalent of, of Siri, with, which is Alexa, you know, the, um, and, and they, just, they just swear by it. You know, they say, they come home at night, say, okay, Alexa, I've got, the, uh, you know, I've got my present, the AGMs tomorrow, first one's at 8.30, can you wake, you know, set the alarm for seven, can you remind me to do this, that and the other, etc. cetera, um, or can you, when I wake up, can you play this music, I want to be nice and relaxed, or well, maybe I wanted to meditate. Can you play that? So in terms of how the, you know, the sort of the, the, the crossover between you know, humans and computers uh, will be significant. I was sort of jokingly saying, uh, as we were doing you know, sort of, I was doing four AGMs, one after the other after the other, you, know, uh, you really didn't need me there. You could have had Alexa, you know, just, just reading, reading the chairman's address. Um, yeah, so to me, it's fascinating how it'll, all, how it'll all change. And so we as investors have to be, have to be focused on this and, and see how the world's going to change and how we can you know, take advantage of that. So 
I mean, this is, this is the... Effectively, over the last um, five or six years, a lot of people have been saying, look, will you set up a global fund? We like how you invest money. You know, we like you know, your risk aversion. Um, and, and can you do it on a global basis? Um, or set up a global fund. And that's, where, that's what we'll be doing um, early next year, uh, probably around April, April May, June. Um, we've got, a, we've got a, a, a team of people that um, we've known uh, the head portfolio manager for nearly 15 years. Uh, they're going to join us um, and we'll be managing a pool of capital uh, with a global fund. In, in terms of the actual, um, if we can flip the slide. Yeah, I mean, if you want to go, if you want to register, go on the website. But, so to me, we could have a situation, you know, it, could, it could be a situation where you know, in, 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 you know, going forwards, you know, maybe by the time we get to March, April next year, I'll just say, look, Alexa, um, can you get the WAM leaders prospectus and can you cross out leaders and put global? Uh, we've got to change the board. We have a slightly different board. Can you print, um, say, we've got 850 here. Can you put 850 prospectuses and can you have them at the Wesley Centre for you know, 12 o'clock today so people can, you know, can uh, use them? So, so who knows how things will happen? But in terms of, in terms of what we're doing, each time we've added uh, an area of, um, of focus for us, and when we went from WAM Capital to we added WAM Leaders a couple of years ago, um, that has added significant value to uh, what we do in terms of having people focused on the top 200 companies, so providing really high quality information to the rest of the team. Uh, and, and the whole idea with Global, um, you know, it'll be an IPO, it'll be a listed investment company, a standalone uh, company um, managed by uh, our people, which we are employing, um, and they will, they will add significant value in terms of identifying global trends, etc., for us back in Australia. In terms of the pool of capital that will be managed, they'll be looking for undervalued growth companies on a global basis. They'll focus on those mids and small uh, area. Um, a few people have said, look, will you invest in the larger companies? That's, that's really up to them. Um, as, uh, and, and as you'll know on WAM Capital, it'll be similar to WAM Capital, but on a global basis, is we can invest anywhere, we, uh, anywhere you want because we understand how important it is to have maximum flexibility. There are points in time where you might be in, in the really smaller stocks and there are points in time where you might have your portfolio tilted to the larger stocks. So it's really having maximum flexibility. I'll, I'll now pass over to Chris, our Chief Investment Officer, who will take you through the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good morning and thanks very much, Jeff, and uh, thank you very much to everybody for attending today. We really appreciate your continued support uh, for all the different WAM vehicles that we manage here, and this is an all-time record attendance today. We had over 800 people RSVP to come along, which is, um, which is fantastic. In terms of my part of the presentation, I'll take you through a few of the different uh, themes that we're looking at at the moment in terms of the structures of the different portfolios and then deep in, dig into a few different uh, stock stories or a few key holdings that we've got across the group at the moment or uh, today. Firstly, in reference to the Australian economy, it remains quite patchy. Uh, we're in this below trend economic growth phase. We're trying to deleverage uh, post the GFC, uh, which feels like a, a long, long time ago now. We've got interest rates at all time record lows at one and a half percent with no sign of those going anywhere for the foreseeable future. In fact, Robert Lowe, chairman of the RBA, recently came out uh, and reiterated that, that interest rates, he sees that interest rates will remain on hold for the foreseeable future, albeit the next move in interest rates will be up. Uh, so we do foresee that interest rates will move higher, albeit very, very slowly uh, over the next decade uh, here in Australia. Uh, meanwhile, we've got a lack of wages growth. We've got inflation, which is stubbornly sit behind, sitting below that 2 to 3% target band that the RBA uh, prefer it to be in. So there's a, a real lack of uh, stimulus, if you like, for interest rates to move higher any time in the very, very short or near term. 
In terms of taking a step back and looking at the more broader economy, what we're seeing is that the east coast of Australia is experiencing rapid growth, uh, that, particularly parts of New South Wales and Victoria. And what we're expecting now in the next five years is for, for the Western Australian economy to want to be one of the best performing uh, parts of the country uh, over the next uh, few years. If we move forward on the slides here, uh, in terms of China, uh, we're lucky enough to spend some time up in Hong Kong more recently, met with a few uh, key analysts at an investment conference uh, who, uh, who live in China and have got really, really close ties to some senior government officials up there. And it's fascinating, the Chinese are the only global economy that nominate what particular, uh, what growth rate that they would like to, uh, to go at, and that's 6.5%. Um, and a lot of people have said that uh, they, they expect the Chinese economy to have a hard landing. We're not seeing that. Uh, we're, we're starting to, we're continuing to see uh, in liquidity and stimulus being thrown into that particular economy. And what does that mean for us back as investors here in Australia? We're leveraging this particular thematic through the resources, uh, the mining services sector. Now, for those of you who uh, don't know us that well uh, in terms of how we invest, we're typically looking for those growth companies, those growth companies that are growing at one and a half to two times their price to earnings ratio, and they've got a catalyst or something that's going to re-rate the share price. And we tend to focus a lot of our time and energy on the industrial sector, as opposed to the direct resource plays. Uh, we're not geologists, we're not mining, uh, specific mining experts, we can't walk across uh, a patch of dirt and tell you if there's gold or something underneath there. That's not our expertise. We typically focus on these industrial companies. And in reference to the WA recovery, we think that will continue over the next three to five years in particular and be one of the strongest performing parts of the country uh, with this. The, the, and, the, and the reasons for that is really we're now entering the, the next uh, mining boom. Uh, we, we don't think this current boom that we've just commenced in terms of mining will be anywhere near what it was like uh, 10 years ago. But we've spending a lot of time in Perth over the last year in particular, where as a team we would have had five or six different trips to Perth, is that we really start, every time we've come back, we've come back with a lot more confidence uh, in terms of what's happening. Things like property prices up 10% over the last 12 months. If you look at the prices of spot commodities like iron ore or coal, you've seen they've had uh, rapid increases in particular over the last 12 to 18 months. So we're playing this particular thematic through uh, the mining services sector. The mining services sector would be the one sector right across the market at the moment that we're most overweight. Uh, so we, and we'll get into a few of the different stocks that we own uh, in the portfolios uh, a little bit later on. Meanwhile, infrastructure is booming. Um, on the next slide here, we, we show, um, and it's a little bit hard to read, and apologies for that. This is a, a chart uh, that's come from the CIMIC group presentation, the old Leighton Holdings. And it shows you from 2007 to 2023, all, a lot of the major infrastructure projects, uh, transport infrastructure projects that are underway or due to commence over the next few years. And the one I'd like to call out there is the West Connects project. It's the green bar on the slide. Uh, it's the largest single infrastructure project uh, that we have undertaken here in Australia since the building of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Estimated cost of around $50 billion. Essentially, it's a road project which links a lot of the major arterial roads here in Sydney, uh, the M4, M5. And essentially, what it will do is open up that southwestern corridor uh, to our second airport, Badgerys Creek Airport, which uh, will be, is due to be completed in 2026. Uh, we spent some time just a few months ago down in the southwestern part of Sydney. Uh, we had a look around and at the Badgerys Creek uh, site. We also visited the Moorbank uh, Transport uh, Hub which is owned by Cube Logistics, uh, which will be a, uh, also, I think, a major driver of economic growth. We think that southwestern corridor of Sydney over the next five to ten years could be one of the fastest growing uh, parts of the Australian economy as we go forward with the opening of the, sec the second airport um, down there. And we expect a lot of um, jobs to be created from the building of that and a lot of uh, businesses to perhaps relocate or establish operations in that particular part of the world. Uh, in terms of... Um, one company that we expect that will set up operations in, in that particular area, and that's the southwestern part of Sydney, is Amazon. And Amazon's been very, very topical uh, for, for a lot of uh, investors over the last 12 months. For those of you who don't know who Amazon are, they are one of the biggest online retailers in the world. Based in Seattle, uh, Washington, uh, one of my good friends who lives over in Seattle um, uh, recently came out to visit an Australian uh, good friend of mine I've known for a long time. And I said, oh, Nick, um, living in Seattle, I'd be interested what percentage of, your, percentage of your total online or total retail shopping that you do for your house, how much of you do you do that on Amazon? He said 
And I said, no, I don't believe you, Nick. That's a lot. He goes, no, no, let me show you. And so he pulled out his, all his recent purchases from a TV to a T-shirt to a pair of shoes to a hammer. Uh, so you name it, Amazon sell it. They're coming. They're coming in a big way. Uh, they've been speculated to launch last week. It hasn't happened. We've been on their website pretty much every hour since then, just checking to see if they have launched yet to launch this morning, last time I checked. But they will launch at some point over the next couple of months. And the question is, what does that mean for us as investors here in Australia, in particular in the retail sector? Well, first of all, what we've done is studied how Amazon have entered various other parts of the world, other markets, markets like Canada, which some would say are very, very similar to our market here in Australia and other parts of Europe. And what we tend to find is uh, that their, their, their entry into those various markets is very, very slow and it's methodical in terms of what products they sell on their website. The common uh, thing that we've picked up is one of the first things they do offer uh, in terms of what they will sell are in the electronics and the white goods space. So we're expecting that uh, companies like JB Hi-Fi and others like Harvey Norman could potentially come under some short-term pressure uh, on the launch of uh, Amazon when, once they do uh, launch. And in, in reference to, uh, to Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, in, in one of his famous quotes is, uh, in reference to his competition, is that your margin is my opportunity. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how they go about business. What they do is they'll enter markets, they'll undercut everybody on price. So for example, a TV that you can buy at JB Hi-Fi today for $1,000, Amazon might offer the exact same product for say $900. So it's great for all of us as consumers, um, but not so good for the margins in particular of some of these retail companies. So as you'd expect at the moment, we're quite underweight the retail sector. We are finding it generally harder to find opportunities in that retail sector at the moment with the advent of not only Amazon entering the market, but if you take a step back, and look at what the competitive landscape looks like now, we're generally seeing a large amount of these large global retailers uh, enter the market and really compete heavily on price with some of, a lot of the existing uh, players that are in the market today. On to the next slide. This one here, we, this one will show you some of our key or selected holdings across WAM Capital, WAM Microcap, WAM Research and WAM Active. Uh, the first one I would like to talk about there is Afterpay. Afterpay has been one of our best performing stocks in WAM Capital and WAM Research over the last six months. The share price has almost doubled. Uh, Afterpay are an online lay-by service. They have ex established now relationships with over 20, uh, sorry, 10,000 uh, retailers in the country and some of the biggest names from David Jones to Meyer to Super Cheap, Super Retail, Premier Investments, just to name a few. They've been really successful in terms of adding merchants onto the platform in particular over the last six months. And that's really been a, a big driver of their growth. Uh, they've had various announcements over the last six months consistently upgrading revenue guidance to the market uh, on the back of the acquisition of TouchCorp, which, uh, which we think will prove to be a very successful acquisition over the medium to longer term. So we've got a very, very high opinion of management at Afterpay. They continue to execute very, very well, and it remains one of our core holdings across the WAM Capital and WAM Research portfolios. The next stock, Virgin Australia, uh, domestic airline, number two player behind Qantas. We were lucky enough to meet with the CEO of Virgin Australia, John Borghetti, uh, a few months ago. Uh, and, and one of the first things that he said to us when we sat down to, to meet him as a team was, you know what, you guys are the first fund manager to see me in two years. And that was like music to our ears. Um, what we're trying to discover, find are these companies that are undiscovered, they're unloved, they're being forgotten about. And Virgin's been listed for a very, very long time uh, on the ASX, but people have forgotten about it. Um, they've generally forgotten about it because of the, the low free float that exists with a company, which is just over 10%. There are a lot of large str strategic shareholders on the share register at the moment, companies like H&A, uh, Etihad Airlines, just to name a few. Why do we like Virgin? Firstly, the domestic airline market is as rational as we've seen it in a very, very long time. Prices are moving up. We experience this with our, the amount, large amount of travel that we do for our work here at Wilson Asset Management. The ticket prices continue to move higher. Um, if you take a step back and look at what Qantas has experienced as well over the last three years in particular, their share price has gone from a dollar up to six dollars. Now we don't think Virgin can perhaps follow a similar share price appreciation uh, to Qantas, what they have experienced in the last few years, but Virgin uh, are going through a large deleveraging program. Their earnings we think have, have rebased uh, and we think that over the next one to two years that uh, they could potentially surprise uh, on the upside with their earnings. And finally, at their AGM just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the board talked about how they had investigated the potential for the company uh, to be delisted, effectively uh, removed from the ASX or 
take out the minority shareholders. So that's another uh, potential uh, catalyst that we're looking for on the back of what the board have communicated to the market only a few weeks ago. And then the last stock on this slide that we'll talk about here is Reckon. Uh, Reckon we've owned for a number of years, accounting software outfit. Um, just more recently, uh, they've announced the sale of one of their key divisions, uh, uh, their, or their key, uh, one of their key products, APS, which is a practice management software. Uh, they managed to sell that particular asset to MYB for $180 million. That compared to the market cap at the time of $135 million. Uh, that leaves Reckon now with a, a, a very profitable business division, which is effectively their Reckon One product, uh, their online or their cloud accounting software product, which generates around $15 million of EBITDA per annum. So with, with Reckon, if this particular transaction is successful and they've announced to the market, they expect the transaction will complete in the second uh, quarter of next calendar year. If they are successful in completing the transaction, uh, we, we forecast and they've talked to, again, to have announced they're intending to look at paying a large special dividend to shareholders. Our forecasts, are, our, our numbers are, we're expecting a, a special dividend uh, of around 80 cents per share. That compares to the share price of $1.50 today. So we think Reckon um, continues to, to look quite attractive and we own those shares in uh, WAM Capital and the WAM Research portfolios. In terms of specific stock stories in, in, that we own in WAM Capital, and these two stocks are two of our biggest holdings in the, in the fund at the moment. The first one is uh, Seven Group, uh, Kerry Stokes, uh, not the media business, uh, the channels, not the media Channel 7 assets. This SGH or uh, SVW is the code for this particular company, is an investment vehicle. Uh, their, their major assets, they've got um, uh, the West Track brand, which is a major distributor for Caterp Caterpillar products here. Uh, in Australia, so large yellow gear. Uh, so on the back of the comments around mining services, we think this is one of the most highly levered companies uh, to that through its, the West Track business. And also they had 100% of Coates Hire now, which used to be listed here in Australia over 10 years ago, which we think is a, a very um, uh, astute purchase that they've made more recently. Again, that particular business is highly levered to what's happening in the infrastructure sector and we, over the next 10 years with the amount of work that's underway in that infrastructure space we think that Coates can continue to um, deliver quite strong earnings. So Seven Group have put out earnings guidance to the market of 5 to 10% growth for this year. Our forecasts are for them to beat that, that, that uh, particular uh, range based on the West Track business and the Coates Hire business, both surprising on the upside. And then the last one here is Channel 9, uh, quite a topical one. Uh, obviously, free-to-air uh, TV company um, continues to look attractive to us on a P of 12. Uh, growing their earnings. They recently put out a, an earnings upgrade just a few weeks ago, uh, which, we th which was a positive catalyst for the share price. Uh, and why do we like Channel 9? And the question is, well, with the advent of Stan and these st streaming companies coming in like Netflix, why are Channel 9 positioned, well, positioned to do well? Well, firstly, Channel 9 this year are going to win the ratings for the first time in a decade. Channel 7 have been the dominant player. They have won the ratings consistently year in, year out for the last decade. Channel 9 are going to have won the ratings for the first time in a decade, as we said earlier. And that's really been driven by a couple of uh, large hit shows that they've had that have come out this year. Um, shows, I don't know if anybody in the room has seen it, but there's one called Married at First Sight, uh, where they bring together complete strangers. They, they get married, and then they say, "Off all the best, good luck. Um, that one's been a ratings bonanza. Over a million people a show were watching that. Uh, one of the best rating shows this year. Um, there's that one. There's another show called Ninja Warrior uh, where you've got an obstacle course set up uh, with athletes who try and get through the course as fast as possible and, and, and obviously uh, and win, the, and win the day there. And, uh, so certainly shows like these two have, have been huge uh, ratings winners and uh, full credit to Hugh Marks and his team at Nine who have who've, uh, invested quite well in content, in particularly local content, and, and, and come out on top with some of these hit shows. In addition to this, you've got the Ashes Cricket underway. Uh, which will go through over the next few months and be a, a ratings uh, winner. And finally, the, uh, as we move into the new year, uh, we'd expect that on the back of their strong ratings this year that they'll be able to monetise those ratings in the form of asking for higher ad dollars from the advertisers for their respective programs into 2018. Uh, so we think Channel 9, again, are well positioned from an earning, earnings perspective uh, and we quite like uh, the prospects for 9 particularly on the back of the uh, media reforms that have gone through Parliament for the finally, and it's been talked about for many, many years. You would have seen that re more recently that uh, we've abolished the two out of three rule and the reach rules, which effectively now uh, open the doors to media companies 
radio air TV companies, radio companies, or even outdoor media companies to amalgamate and merge. Um, so those rules have just been passed uh, through Parliament only in the last six weeks. Uh, so that potentially is another thing that we're keeping an eye out for for the media sector over the next few years. WAM Microcap, uh, two stocks or two of our bigger holdings in WAM Microcap. First, the Emico. Uh, Emico, again, is a mining services company, primarily a rental company, uh, with operations, the majority of their operations now uh, here in Australia. We think it's the most highly levered stock on the ASX to improving mining cycle. Uh, it's improving its balance sheet. The gearing's now come back down to uh, under three times. Uh, they've put out some really strong announcements in the last six months, uh, in earnings improving, um, utilisation improving, and we think that price will eventually kick in uh, for this company where they can really start to expand margins quite dramatically over the next one to three years. So we think Emico are very, very well positioned uh, in terms of uh, the leverage to the improving um, improvement in the mining side of things. And secondly, Pacific Current Group is another one that we own. It's the old Treasury Group. They're a fund of fund. They, they have various stakes in uh, different funds management businesses, predominantly overseas businesses. Uh, there's one that they've, that's been one very highly successful uh, in more recent times, Aperio, which is experiencing uh, very rapid inflows into that particular company. So they've, they've, uh, effect, they've remodelled the portfolio in terms of the fund managers that they're invested in, particularly in the last six to 12 months. The, the team at Pacific Current have done a very, very good job. Uh, and we think that at these prices, uh, we think it still remains quite cheap. Uh, only on a P of 14, we think it can grow at anywhere from 15 to 20% uh, over the next few years. So we think that uh, Pacific Current uh, fits well within our micro WAM microcap uh, portfolio. I'll now hand it over to portfolio manager Oscar Oberg to take you through the next part of the presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, today I'm going to take you through uh, two stocks we quite liked at the moment within WAM Research. First stock I'd like to take you through is uh, G8 Education. Now, G8 is Australia's uh, largest childcare operator with over 500 centres across the nation. Business has grown through acquisition, currently has 6% market share of what is a highly fragmented uh, industry. As you may be aware, childcare affordability has been a major issue for the government for some time, and this has led to the new funding package that's set to occur from 1st of July next year. Under this new uh, funding package, lower to middle income families will be better off to the tune of around 20 to 30% in terms of the subsidies that they receive for the government for their childcare. With G8's portfolio of centres weighted to lower to middle income families across Australia, we believe the increase in demand for childcare places will fuel organic growth and therefore occupancy across their portfolio. Furthermore, we also like uh, G8's new CEO, whose simplified strategy is focused on reducing net debt organic growth and acquisition to drive a long-term EPS target of 40 cents a share, which is around 20% higher than current consensus expectations. So for these reasons, we like G8 and uh, see upside to the share price over the medium term. Another stock we uh, quite like at the moment and have liked for some time is PSC, PSC Insurance. We've owned PSC since its IPO back in November 2015, currently own the stock within WAM Capital, WAM Research and WAM Micro. PSC is an insurance broking business uh, providing commercial insurance services to small to medium, in, in, uh, medium enterprises across Australia and the UK. Our initial catalyst to buy PSC was due to its high quality management team that previously had experience in rolling up uh, insurance broking acquisitions through their time at OAMPS, which became the third largest insurance broker in the country before it was acquired by West Farms in 2006. Furthermore, we liked the fact that um, management were aligned with shareholders given that management owns 60% of the shares on issue, and in fact, uh, management have continued to buy more shares on market over the last two years since they IPO'd. The strategy with PSC continues to be a simple one, with management um, acquiring underperforming insurance broking acquisitions, turning these businesses around, driving cost savings, and, and delivering earnings expectations that so far uh, beaten, beaten the market's view on the stock. An example of this was at their re recent AGM, where PSC guided to 20% profit growth uh, for the first half 18 result. So given our positive view on uh, the acquisition pipeline for PSC and also rising uh, commercial uh, lines insurance premiums in the market, we see a strong prospect for double digit earnings growth for PSC over the next few years. I'd now like to pass it on to Martin Hickson, uh, Senior Portfolio Manager, to talk about uh, WAM Active. Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks, Oscar. So the next two stocks are two market-driven stocks. The first is Platinum. So we hold shares in Platinum in WAM Capital, WAM Active, WAM Leaders and Century Australia. Platinum is one of Australia's largest fund managers. Uh, they're an international equity fund manager, so they're exposed to the thematic of Australian investors shifting higher allocations of their portfolios to international equities. However, it's not all rosy for Platinum. Over the last three or four years, Platinum uh, performance has been quite poor. They've underperformed their benchmark. And this has led to uh, uh, la a large increase in redemptions or funds flowing out of Platinum's products. In FY17 alone, Platinum experienced $3.5 billion worth of redemptions. However, their performance was starting to improve. We started buying shares in Platinum in July this year, and at the time, their performance for the year was 6% ahead of their benchmark. And we believe that this would eventually lead to uh, a, a turnaround in fund flows, lead to apl uh, applications or funds flowing into Platinum's products, and eventually lead to performance fees. At the time when we started buying shares, there was maximum hatred for the stock. There was eight sell-side equity analysts who all had either a sell or a hold recommendation on the stock. There wasn't a single analyst across the street who thought that Platinum's share price would rally. And so uh, we started buying shares at this point in July. Uh, at their AGM three weeks ago, they announced that the uh, perf strong performance has continued. Uh, redemptions have slowed, and over that period, there's been uh, uh, fund inflows of $600 million. And this has led to a significant re-rating in the Platinum share price. The second market-driven stock story is Pete. Uh, we hold shares in Pete in WAM Capital and WAM Active. Uh, Pete are a large property developer. Their, their key exposures are the Western Australian and the Victorian property markets. Uh, the key attraction for us was this exposure to the WA and the Perth markets. Uh, we started buying shares in Pete at $1.20 earlier this calendar year, and at the time that was also their NTA. So we're buying shares in Pete at their NTA. And in addition to that, we're getting their funds management business, which represents one third of Pete's earnings for free. So it was significantly trading under what we believe uh, that the company was worth. As I mentioned, they've got a large exposure to WA. 35% of Pete's land bank is made up of uh, lots or uh, estates in the WA market. However, in FY17, due to the depressed market in Perth and WA, uh, this, this uh, state only represented 14% of Pete's earnings. So as Chris mentioned, as we, we believe that the mining uh, and resources industry is recovering. We believe that this will lead to uh, you know, a recovery in the Perth and WA economy. Uh, and we believe that Pete's earnings have a significant exposure and leverage to this. We think that Pete uh, is one of the, the most leveraged companies on the ASX to, a, a, to an improving WA and Perth economy, which is why we hold shares in Pete. I'll now pass over to Matt Haupt to talk about some current market themes. Thanks, Martin, and good afternoon, everyone. The first few slides I would like to talk about is why are equity markets where they are, then try and look forward as well and think where will equity markets go to and when will we get a correction. So the first slide here is just explaining central banks versus equity markets. So this first slide here is one of my favourite. It just shows you what central banks have done post-GFC. So before the GFC, central bank balance sheets were around $3 trillion. Throughout the, the, the few years after that, you can see a massive amount of stimulus. So $11 trillion was thrown into the market. These were central banks trying to stimulate growth and trying to push interest rates down. When you push interest rates down, asset prices go up. So a lot of the, the re-rating in the share market for this period of time, a decade post GFC, was in relation to lower interest rates. You can see there, the, the Fed, ECB and BOJ, with the three major central banks stimulating their uh, currencies, or lowering their currencies and stimulating the economy, the ECB for a period actually tried to withdraw stimulus and went through austerity. They quickly realised this didn't work, and this was to, during 2013. So it caused some harm within the ECB region, and they actually went back to stimulating the economy. So currently there's $9 trillion of bonds outstanding that have negative yielding in, um, face value. It's just incredible. This is an abnormal situation. It's not normal. It's been going on for 10 years. But because it's been going on for so long, it actually feels normal now. <laughs> but you can see there, in that forecast period there, we expect liquidity to be withdrawn. So the big move will be the Fed. So they're starting to withdraw liquidity right now. 
they're winding back their stimulus program and pulling money out of the market. The ECB are probably three years behind and the BOJ, well, they've been doing this for about 20 years. So we expect that to continue. But one thing that has changed is global growth has picked up. So the stimulus was coming through and pushing down interest rates, but the economies weren't firing. But just recently, in the last 18 months, all the leading indicators, and this is a measure of 23 countries out there and all the leading indicators. So this is insight onto how global growth will play out. As you can see there, anything above that dark line of zero is an expanding economy or accelerating potential of that economy. This survey, as I said, is 23 countries and it's showing a great acceleration in global growth. So the situation we have now is central banks can potentially pull out liquidity and hopefully asset values hold up. But this is a debate that's long running and we don't know how it will play out. Our, our initial view is it's going to be a pretty volatile transition period as liquidity is withdrawn because naturally when interest rates go up, asset prices go down. This next slide is the US. So this is trying to look forward. So when we look at the US, you look at a few major factors. One of them is unemployment. So you can see there, post GFC, or just right after the GFC, unemployment got to almost 10% in the US and it's been steadily coming off. Right at the end there, you can see it's approaching low fours. We forecast unemployment in the US could get down to around 3.5%. The real interesting thing though is what does this mean for the future? And you can see there, the vertical shaded areas are recessions. And history shows us that every time unemployment goes up by three quarters of 1%, a recession happens. And this has happened back to the 1950s. So our best guess is a 2019 recession for the US. This is, sounds bad in theory, but it should be a very shallow recession. The reason why I say this is the deleveraging that's happened on a household level has, has been quite big and we think it will be a very shallow financial recession. It won't be a, a big property-led recession where there's a whole period of, you know, property-led recession can go on for 10 years like we've seen. This should be a, just a slowdown in growth and an unemployment rate that should tick up slightly. So it shouldn't be a massive deal. But this next slide is showing the S&P 500 index and what happens during recessions. And again, the shaded vertical areas are bear markets. Oh, sorry, they're the recessions. And you can see the fall in the S&P 500 index co coincides with recessions. So it looks like 2019 could be a pretty tough year for equities. If history is anything to gauge by, we should be getting a bear market in 2019. Again, this should be a very short one and a V-shaped one because you don't have a systemic problem underlying this recession and impending bear market. So it should be very short. And again, one of the jobs we have as fund managers is trying to react to the current environment. So we actually, if the recession is not bad on a, on a, a personal level for people, we actually enjoy recessions because they present great opportunities to invest money and make a lot of returns in a short period of time. The next slide I'll talk about is um, oil. And we've played this in WAM Leaders and Century a, a few ways. The, the main ways we've played it is through direct exposures like Santos, Origin, Woodside, Oil Search, and the indirect Wally Parsons. So for us, why did we like oil? Why did we go long oil? We're, we're predominantly bottom up stock pickers, but you've got to have a look at the industry. And if the industry is favorable, generally all those companies within that industry will perform well. And then if you can find a catalyst, you can get really good performance. So this chart is showing you what OPEC are trying to do at the moment. So OPEC, in 2014, they abandoned the market, or well, the quota system they had in place. They went to a market-based supply and flooded the market with oil. Oil ended up 500 million barrels of inventory above the five-year average, and OPEC's target is to bring the five-year average, uh, bring the oil inventories back to the five-year average. As you can see there, that dark blue line is the inventory level. Currently, we're about 200 million barrels higher than the five-year average. So we expect OPEC, which are meeting this week, to extend their cut. So the current cut lasts to March 2018. At the moment, all supply and all demand are holding around the same level of 96 million barrels per day. 
OPEC are pulling out 1.8 million barrels per day, which is around 2% of um, global supply. So we'd expect OPEC to continue this um, cut and hopefully they extend it to the end of 2018. At the moment, there's high level talks between Russia. Will, will they participate in the OPEC deal because they're a non-OPEC member? The talk is they will. And if we get a six month extension, it's probably neutral. A three month extension, oil will probably goes down. And uh, into the end of 2018 extension, be extremely positive for oil and I expect a lot of those stocks to rally off the back of that. The next chart is around the insurance industry. So when we look at the, what central banks will try and do, we'll push down interest rates. And insurance companies earn a lot of their money from investing the premiums they receive from us, predominantly in fixed interest. So insurers' book could be about 80, 90% fixed interest. So for years, for over a decade, they haven't been able to earn a return on their premiums. So we, we think it will, this will change, like I was showing there with the, with the central banks unwinding monetary policy we expect interest rates to increase. So the insurance sector should really benefit from this. Another thing, if interest rates go up, reinsurance rates, which have been historically low for 10 years as well, should go up, which means insurers can put up their premiums. So it should have very good dynamics for the insurance sector if all this plays out how we think. Also, you've had major CAT events in the US. So there's been a, a huge amount of time before you had major CAT4 events hit the US um, onshore. And that happened this year. And when this happens, the industry has to absorb a lot of losses. So at the moment, there's around 140 billion to 160 billion of losses. We estimate around the last six months, we'd expect this to flow onto reinsurance rates in January of this year. So for in reinsurance, the major renewal period is, is January. So we'll get our first um, look at that in January of next year. If the reinsurance rates have gone up, insurance companies should have a really good 12 months. The way we've played it in WAM Leaders and Century is through IAG, Suncorp and QBE for the brave. <laughs> and the major banks. So bank bashing has become a national sport. Politicians, it, it's a vote winner. So the nationals are even turning on the banks now. Labor want to do a Royal Commission. All this talk of regulation is very painful for a bank. It will cost a lot of money, but ultimately it will hurt the Australian economy too because the imposition on banks, they'll just pass on a lot of the costs. Also, a Royal Commission probably costs a couple hundred million dollars. So I'm not sure what outcome they want, um, the politicians, but a lot of the changes banks have made in the last five years, they have actually improved. They don't have the best reputation. They are trying to fix that. We think that will continue but putting that aside, the bank results have actually been really strong. So banks have had a couple of years of pretty benign pricing environments, but the last 12 months, they've been able to reprice their books a couple of times through um, hiking interest only and investor loans. There is one more chance for the banks to increase rates when APRA come out with the mortgage risk weights, which they said they'll put out this calendar year, but we're fast approaching the end of the year and we haven't heard anything. So when we caught up with all the, the major banks, they're still waiting for APRA to come out with mortgage risk weights. If they come out and put mortgage risk weights up, the banks, in my view, would reprice again. And this would be incredibly positive for the banks. But on the medium to long term view, it's hard to make a bull case for the Australian banks. Bad debts are at cyclical lows. Funding costs are, are really low. Capital's good. But it's, Hard to find too many positives because credit growth has been running quite, quite fast. Business credit growth is really slow. But to build a bull case now is really hard, for, hard to do with the Australian banks. They've probably got one to two good reporting periods left and then it looks a bit tougher. If you get a housing market correction, obviously bad debts will go up and their profits will get really hurt. But at this point in time, they're probably a neutral in our view. But on the medium to longer term, it's hard to make a bull case for them. I'll now hand over to John Ayoub who will run through some selected holdings in WAM Leaders and Century and then drill down into a few stocks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, many of the names behind me, you'll, you, you would recognise their household names. These are a snapshot of the core holdings in, within WAM Leaders and Century. 
Uh, the first that I'll touch on quickly is Woolworths. Uh, Woolworths is a name that we have liked for some time and you've heard us talk about it before. Uh, going forward, why we still like Woolworths, uh, first and foremost, we think there's a lot of metrics that they still have catch up uh, on, on coals to play out. Uh, next up, Dan Murphy's, we think is a wonderful business and it will keep on delivering. Next, Kmart, um, sorry, I should say Big W. Now, Big W is where there's a lot of contention in the market around uh, the, the, the livelihood of um, Big, w going for, Big W going forward. We think that uh, the CEO, Brad Banducci, has done a wonderful job of rebasing that, setting a new direction forward. And we are a little bit more optimistic uh, than where the market is at the moment on that name. And lastly, uh, Woolworths is sitting on around $2.4 billion worth of franking credits. And tomorrow is a very key day with the ACCC deciding on uh, the BP approval of the, the petrol station business. We, 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 we forecast, if that's approved, that there is a strong likelihood that a fully franked special dividend or some other form of capital return could drive the share price further north over the next six to 12 months. Uh, another name there we, we continue to like is the Star Entertainment Group. Uh, we think that this is the single best way to play uh, tourism into Australia in the ASX 200. Uh, Star has obviously been affected over the last 12 months from some of the VIP clampdowns in China. We think that's bottomed and going forward we, we expect some very strong numbers coming out of um, Star Group at the next two updates. And also their capital light model in, ex in expanding their uh, hotel footprint with their JVs will put some good stead for future growth. And also many of the other names you've, you've heard us talk about before and we continue to think these as core positions within the portfolio. Uh, onto the next slide, um, and also the next two slides, WAM Leaders and the, and the Century, they, these, are, these are core positions uh, within both those portfolios. Uh, the first name is Borel that I'd like to talk about. Uh, Borel is the single best play we feel to, uh, to get exposure to the infrastructure story that Chris was talking about earlier. Domestically, uh, infrastructure spend will continue uh, and will continue to grow for the next three to five years. And for Borel this means there is volume upgrades and price upgrades which should drive domestic earnings uh, for the next three to five years. Yeah, we, we, we acknowledge there is probably a residential slowdown coming at some stage, but you know, approvals always lag, uh, construction. Uh, so construction, we feel, will carry this forward for the next two years. Uh, moving over to the other side of the business, which we're more excited about, uh, that's the headwaters business which they recently acquired in the US. About a year ago, we were sitting in Canberra when Borrell announced uh, that they were buying this headwaters business and we, we were at a bit of a loss. We didn't really know what, they, what they'd acquired. Um, it was a fly ash, bit, fly ash business and a stone business, uh, predominantly fly ash and stone business in the US. Uh, after doing a fair bit of DD and uh, seeing a very negative response from the market, we saw this as a wonderful opportunity to get, get a position in Borel. The reason why we like this business, if you look at um, cement, consumption, cement consumption and concrete um, consumption in the US going forward, they're at the start of an infrastructure cycle. They're also at the start of a residential cycle, whilst we're probably mid-term and late-term um, respectively. Fly ash is used in cement um, in the US, and if you look at the network and distribution strength that Headwaters has in the US, no one can compete with this, this, this network that they have. So we think, looking at the, re the regulation uh, and the increasing uh, demand for fly ash in the US, we, we think this puts Borel in a wonderful position to capitalise this on this for the next three to, three to five to ten years, potentially. Uh, the next one was, uh, next stock we'll talk about is Origin. Now, when we're pulling these slides together around two or three weeks ago, we, we realised that Origin would be hosting an investor day right in the middle of the roadshow. So we took a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, a chance uh, and it proved out to be right. Yesterday I was, I was at the Origin investor day and much of, much of the reasons why we invest in Origin were articulated yesterday. First and foremost, we see Origin about two years behind where Santos is. And that, and that for us means that there is, a, there is a productive cost out story to come and this is just the start of it. Yesterday they announced a $500 million cost out program which we think is very conservative. Um, so we think that that will carry their earnings through for the next two to three years. Uh, some good news actually for all us uh, electricity payers, there is competition coming. Uh, so our, our electricity prices should come down a little bit like with the emergence of a linter in the, in the east coast market. But we, we, with saying that, Origin's positioning and their ability to kind of focus on customers should carry them through that. So Origin we, we continue to see as a wonderful uh, core position within our portfolio. Uh, next up, now you must think we're a little bit uh, crazy after the talk of Amazon to put Westfield up there. Uh, Westfield, when we refer to Westfield, this isn't Westfield uh, Bondi Junction or Westfield uh, Sydney Centre. 
Westfields here is Westfield, the US business. Um, and it's nice to be aligned for once with the Lowy family, where, all their, where, their, where the vast majority of their, their wealth is tied up in Westfield. Now, why we like Westfield, first and foremost, what they are developing is not strip malls or uh, normal shopping centres. They're developing the new downtowns of the future. So if you look at what, where they're spending the money, the, the makeup of uh, these new downtowns, as I prefer to call them, you'll see more, enter more entertainment facilities. You'll see more food offering. You'll see more gyms. So what they're doing is they're driving traffic to these centres more than ever before. Next up, you're seeing major brands turn up in these, in these precincts. Now, one thing we do know about brands is they don't like to discount and they don't like to, to, to relinquish control to the likes of Amazon to distribute their product. So when you go for a walk around Westfield's malls of the future, um, and I was lucky enough to go to their, one of their flagship ones in Century City in Los Angeles, what you find is a, a lot more brands. So you'll see the likes of um, uh, Tesla, you'll see Microsoft, you'll see Apple, but what you also see in one of the great ironic twists is Amazon bookstores. Amazon are opening bookstores within Westfields. Let's just take a moment to think about that. So for us, you know, we think it's insulated. 83% of Westfields' portfolio is in these tier one, um, tier one shopping centres, these, these, these destination drivers. And we suspect that over time, these will be highly desirable assets to sovereign wealth funds and the like. So if you kind of roll forward two years, you look at their development pipeline, we see around $10 worth of value in the share price. In saying that, we are conscious of you know, the, the, the bond proxies and the yield trades, you know, and it is our only REIT within the portfolio. Uh, and lastly, I'll keep this one brief because we've already spoken about a number of fund managers. Uh, Janice Henderson Group, uh, we bought that one some time ago across the, whole, across the whole group in a number of the funds. And the reason why we like that is, again, the market, the market didn't look at the merger as favourably as we did. This was the merger of Janus and Henderson Group. And the key, the key reason we like this is, this, there, is there is material upside to the synergy target that they've put out to the marketplace. Uh, and that's going to be driven by revenue synergy, in our view, because of the increased distribution network um, and, the, and, the, and the ongoing performance of the group. We see this continuing to drive further north with the market. Uh, on that, I'll leave it there and I'll pass over to Kate, our CEO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny, and welcome everyone. For those of you who I haven't met already, I'm Kate Thorley, the CEO of Wilson Asset Management, and I'm going to take you through the final part of our presentation. So this first slide is WAM Capital's uh, share price uh, premium and discount over the last uh, essentially two decades since we've been listed. And really, what we want shareholders to be aware of with all listed investment companies is that the, um, you know, what the assets are worth, and in this case, Wham Capital's assets are actually worth around $1.97, and yet the share price is trading at uh, $2.36. So we see these premiums and discounts as opportunities. Uh, as, as part of our investment strategy, we like to buy a dollar of assets for 80 cents in the hope that at some point we'll, we'll get that dollar. So really, it is something to be mindful of. Wham Capital and Wham Research are both trading at, at quite sizable premiums. Uh, Wham Active and Wham Microcap are also trading at premiums. Uh, Century Australia is trading around NTA, and Wham Leaders is trading just a little bit below uh, what its assets are worth. And we think Wham Leaders is trading a bit below its assets because of the option issue. Uh, that's just come to a close on the 17th of November. So uh, those options were issued uh, during the IPO. And what we tend to find is uh, the options tend to put pressure on the share price. So uh, we think that uh, over time, the share price of WAM leaders will hopefully re-rate to trade around NTA, if not a little, uh, a little above, if uh, our other LICs are anything to go by. The profits reserves, so this is essentially, if you look at our annual report, this is essentially uh, where we are quarantining profits to be able to pay dividends. So uh, it is something, again, that we ask shareholders to be mindful of uh, because it's, it indicates, I guess, the sustainability of our dividends. And all of our LICs has a key objective of paying 
fully frank dividends to our shareholders and our ability to pay fully frank dividends is really a function of our profits reserves. So in WAM Capital, um, I mean, this is assuming we don't change the dividends from last year. It is also assuming we don't make any more money, which let's, let's hope that's worst case. Uh, WAM Capital's got a bit over a year um, in the profits reserve. WAM Leaders is the same, 1.3. That's on a fully diluted basis. WAM Active, a year and a half. And WAM Research has got the healthiest of all the uh, profits reserve, and it has over three and a half years. Activism is on the rise. And this slide's really just to uh, show you that both globally and here domestically, activism is on the rise. And we saw in Australia alone last year that about 60 companies were subject uh, to activists. So part of our um, purpose is to make a difference for shareholders, and that's our, our uh, ability to generate returns for you. But we also think uh, part of our making a difference needs to be standing up for shareholders' rights and, and standing up for what we believe is fair. And you'll see us do this on a number of occasions, but we, we like to call ourselves accidental activists. So that's, that's really what the message is here. In, in terms of making a difference, uh, we like to also go out into the community and uh, give our time. Uh, so this is the team last year went out to a community centre and, um, and helped out there. We, we do various uh, charity uh, runs, etc., and raise money. Um, last month in October, it was Mental Health Awareness Month, and we ran a number of um, initiatives. And really, what the key was, was A, to reduce the stigma of mental health, but was also a chance for us to uh, ch uh, check in with our co-workers and um, with our loved ones just to make sure everyone was um, OK. And if they're not you know, make sure they've got the right support in place. Uh, you'll notice uh, a couple of the team, Marty, our general manager, our CFO, uh, Jesse, and also our head of corporate affairs, James, are all sporting very attractive uh, moustaches for Movember, which is terrific because, again, it's just raising awareness and raising uh, funds for uh, some men's uh, health charities. And finally, I mean, this was a really big milestone in the business. We listed WAM microcap in June. And if you considered the two future generation vehicles that we created and the old uh, Wilson Leaders, which is now uh, ALF or Australian Leaders Fund, this was our eighth IPO in the business. So this is a, a picture of myself and the team celebrating down at the ASX. And another, in terms of making a difference, um, you would have all heard us talk about the future generation vehicles and something that we're all incredibly proud of and, and really pleased to be able to continue to support um, is the two future gen vehicles. And their presentation uh, will be on here uh, straight after lunch uh, at 12.30. So um, actually, no, not at 12.30. That, that must be the other cities. So sorry, at 1.30. Uh, and um, I would encourage, no, it's at 2 o'clock actually, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to, to stay for that presentation. Uh, we'll be hearing uh, from Justin Breitling at Watermark and uh, Frank Casarotti at Magellan and then also two of the charities that are supported by these vehicles. So it'll be a really terrific presentation. And I just want to show you a quick uh, video about these two uh, entities. So that's, that's sort of basically the end of the presentation. I'm now going to invite 
the team back up on stage for the moderated Q&A. WAM leaders listed in May 2016 and WAM microcap uh, listed in June uh, this year. Chris and Matt, can I ask each of you to comment on how these listed investment companies have performed? Thanks, Kate. I'll, I'll start with WAM leaders. So, um, floated last year in May. Um, we took a couple of months to invest some money. Um, we had a, a bit of a, a rough period through Brexit when we're trying to deploy the cash and then had Donald Trump, so a few major events throughout that period. But thankfully, the portfolio performed well. Probably the thing to talk about is um, around the option issue, so a really heavy option issue, a one-for-one. One. Um, options were converted around 96%, so that's just finished in November, uh, 17th of November. So the share price has been pretty weak off the back of a lot of people, um, as has been touched on this morning and this afternoon, on, on options with hedge funds arbitraging, selling the head stock, trying to arbitrage the difference between the head stock and the options. So they've been really sitting heavy on the stock. Post the, the options being exercised or finally completed, we'd hope over the next few weeks a lot of that stock will wash out through the market. It's really hard to guess how long it will take, but best guess is it maybe three to four weeks. But like I said, it's really hard to gauge on how long this will take to, um, for the stock to wash out through the market. So hopefully post that, the, uh, the share price could trade back towards the NTA. So NTA, as we sit today, it's probably between $1.18 and $1.19, and the share price is $1.13, $1.14 at the moment. So hopefully over time, once all those options have been through the market, share price can go up to the, at least the NTA, and then if history is a guide, uh, like the other funds, potentially at a premium. So um, I think we're through the worst of the option issue now that's put behind us, and now we can push forward, and hopefully the share price will... will push forward going, going from here. Thanks, Kate. Where microcap was floated, uh, as a lot of you know, in June of this year, uh, we've been very, very pleased. We raised $154 million at $1.10. That compares to the share price today of one thirty two. So the share price uh, has performed very, very strongly, uh, albeit early days. And I think the, the full team have done a phenomenal job in terms of our early performance, where the gross portfolio is up almost 20% in the first six months. So we've been very, very pleased with how, uh, how we're going, albeit early days. Uh, it, a couple of observations. It, we initially thought it might take six months to invest the money uh, once we did receive it in June, uh, given the illiquid nature in a lot of cases in the micro cap end of the market. It actually took us two months, so it happened a lot quicker than we thought. And when we got to full investment, which was around at the end of July, uh, we held around 70 to 80 different companies in the portfolio and we held 25% cash. And that's very, very similar to how the portfolio looks today. So uh, we're micro cap, early days, but off to a good start. And as we said at the IPO, the board will meet uh, for the first time to assess the first full six months of results in February. And that's when the board will determine uh, what the level of dividend uh, will be for that particular product. But we've got plenty of profit reserves there as you'd expect given the start we've made to the, uh, to the fund. That's great. Thanks, Chris. And Jeff, could you talk about the, the current premiums, as I mentioned, in each of the vehicles, and in particular WAM Capital and WAM Research? Do you think that they're sustainable? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? The, you know, I, I tend to be a market uh, person that believes in cycles. So if you believe in cycles that things trade at premiums and things trade at discounts. And obviously you want to buy them when they're a discount and you want to sell them when they're at a premium. Um, you know, the, I mean, people, when, when I tell that to people, you know, they say, oh, well, what about your performance? You know, aren't people paying for the, up for the performance? Hey, I, I don't like paying up for anything. <laughs> you know, particularly someone else's performance. And who knows you know, what the performance will be going forward. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, it's a it's a tricky one. Is it is it secular? Yeah, you know, is, is it cyclical or is it secular? Yeah, you know, as the fact that we you know, engage with shareholders and communicate with shareholders, um, you know, to to the level we do, does that mean that the that will protect us a little bit? Um, you know, when things aren't as positive as they are now. Okay, that's great. And uh, and the outlook for the dividends. I spoke about the profits reserves. Could, could you? Yeah, and, and the plan is to gently increase those dividends. Um, and, and, and as you'd be aware, how we pay our dividends is a combination of 
dividends we receive from shares we invest in, but also it's part, you know, probably broadly a third of uh, the dividends we pay out come from other companies' dividends that we invest in. And the other two thirds comes from realised profit. Um, so our ability to keep paying dividends is a function of our ability to keep making, uh, making money. But the, all the boards you know, like to gently increase them. Um, if, if we run out of profit reserve, then th there's a rebasing occurs, and that happened with WAM Capital during GFC. You know, it had to rebase, okay. and then slowly increase them again over time. Okay. And, and Chris, uh, what have the benefits been in terms of the growth in the funds under management? Uh, could you talk about the benefits to shareholders? Thanks, Kate. And the, the business has grown dramatically in the last five to seven years in particular, going from $300 million of funds under management to almost $3 billion of FUM um, today. And there's been some uh, clear benefits come through. I think it's fair to say I, mean, I personally underestimated some of these benefits. And firstly, the, the, the one clear standout is that we've been continue, we continue to be able to hire and recruit really high quality individuals. And we've got the, the investment team, uh, majority of the investment team up here on the stage today. Uh, we, the, the quality of people that have joined the business, uh, going from six people when I started 11 years ago to 26 people today, the quality of people right across the business that we've been able to attract has been very, very pleasing and I think a clear benefit um, to shareholders. Uh, other benefits that have been larger, we're far more attractive and interesting to financial planner groups than we ever have been before. So we, we're experiencing, particularly with the WAM Leaders product, a large part of that uh, uh, share register is, is owned by uh, financial planner groups. Um, research houses like Morningstar and Zenith, uh, just to name a couple, uh, for the first time ever uh, in the last few years have started to write research on our particular products, again broadening the, uh, the audience to, have to the various uh, WAM entities. And finally, uh, we're far more relevant to our stockbroking network than we ever have been uh, before. Uh, in terms of being larger and, and paying out more commissions on the trades that we execute in the market on a daily basis. And, and an example of, in particular at the moment, where, and I think Jeff spoke about it a little bit earlier in the, in the AGMs, is that uh, in good markets, in good times like we are in at the moment, where the, the market is performing very, very strongly, uh, there's a lot of corporate activity, uh, not only from an M&A perspective, but from an IPO and a secondary capital raising perspective. And just this morning, we were, uh, we were subject, one of our shareholdings in WAM Capital and WAM Microcap Integral Diagnostics, a real radiology company, uh, received a takeover approach, um, a takeover bid, uh, which has certainly um, seen the shares move higher today. Uh, and, and on the IPO for and secondary capital raising front, we are finding now, more than ever, that our allocations in deals are a lot better than what they were, say, 10 years ago. Um, in a lot of instances at the moment, uh, we are, if not one of the top allocations, we are right up there in terms of the, what we're receiving in a lot of these deals. And just more recently, we've seen companies like NetWealth, uh, Propel Funerals, People Infrastructure, there's three more recent examples, only last week, where we participated in all three of those deals and the shares are trading anywhere from 30 to 50% higher already uh, from those particular um, deals that we participated in. So, I mean, there's some of the uh, clear benefits that we are starting to see and living at the moment um, in terms of being larger. Thanks, Chris. And, and Jeff, we've had a number of questions around Century Australia. It's focused on the top 300 and WAM Leaders is focused on the top 200. Um, the questions have been around, does it make sense at some point that these entities uh, merge? Yeah, look, thanks, Kate. Um, and obviously, that's a you know, there's there's two lots of boards there. There's a Century Board and the WAM Leaders Board, um, and uh, you know, they'll have to work work that out. But in terms of a number of shareholders have said, look, doesn't it make sense you're doing top 200, top 300? Um, that uh, they they do merge. In terms of um, the overlap, well, it, it's the same investment team, you know, John and and um, and Matt. Uh, 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 managing that money, uh, and in terms, uh, I suppose, with Century Australia, we raised the money last year, we recapitalised it, we took over the management of it, probably got to give it a little bit of time, you know, it's trading a bit of a discount to NTA, you know, we'd be hoping it would trade at NTA or a premium, um, yeah, but maybe longer term, it, you know, it does make, make sense that something happens there. Okay, and, and Jeff, I'll stay with you. Um, just in terms of WAM Global, you spoke about 
Um, what's the timing uh, for that yeah. email I see? Uh, Alexa, what's the time? No, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the the timing is, you know, we, I think we we're talking about lodging the prospectus um, around April, and we'll probably have it open, um, you know, May and probably close in June ar around that time of next year. Okay, great. And in terms of um, the investment portfolio, you talked about a lot of stocks that you like, and that some of the IPOs that have gone up substantially. Would you like to touch on perhaps a couple of stocks that, that haven't worked and what yep. what you've learnt from that as a, as a team, but also something that the investors can perhaps take away yep. when they're managing their portfolios? Thanks, Kate. And fund managers are great at talking to you about what, what they're good at and what, where they've made all their money. They don't like talking about their mistakes. And um, uh, we, we make mistakes every day and learn from them. Uh, and we sit as a team every quarter formally where we go through our uh, attribution, where we've made and lost money for the quarter, and we sit as a team and discuss what went right, what went wrong, what are the lessons we can learn from all this, and both positive and negative. And in terms of um, uh, a few mistakes that we've, or well, a mistake that we've made in the last six months since we last caught up, uh, was in iSelect. Uh, we were invested in iSelect earlier in the year. That iSelect is an online comparison website, primarily for private health insurance, uh, energy, uh, gas, and telecommunications. Uh, we were invested in iSelect. Uh, uh, we thought that the, the momentum in the business under the new, uh, new leadership uh, was, um, was there. Uh, and what we did underestimate, one lesson that we really did learn was how expensive private health insurance is at the moment. Um, as a family of four of home, we spend almost $500 a month on, uh, on our private health insurance. So it's really burning a significant hole in consumers' pockets. And what we underestimated was um, that that, that, that uh, is starting to really materially uh, come off for I Select. Uh, they came out in August and disappointed the market with a, a, a result which missed expectations. Uh, the shares fell from over $2 to $175. Uh, we, we sold right out of our position uh, in the day or two after that result came out. Uh, so very, very disappointing. Uh, we've, the shares now trade at $1.40. So it's certainly, it is, um, we're not, we're looking at it at the moment in terms of um, from a share price specific perspective, a good business, but everything's got a price. Uh, but that's certainly, in terms of the lessons that we made, uh, we learnt uh, the private health insurance space is one, and, uh, and certainly uh, we overestimated what we think the company could potentially earn uh, over, the, over that last 12 months. And I hand over to Matt to talk yeah. about WAM leaders. Yeah, probably the one that stands out was Blue Scope Steel. I think we forgot it was a steel company. And they have highly <laughs> cyclical uh, earnings with big fixed costs. So, I mean, the shares had gone up 100%. We were patting ourselves on the back. Um, then they came out in August of this year and gave out guidance. And it was a 20% downgrade. The stock was down 20% on, on the day. The lesson we learned is, yeah, cyclical stocks, you really got to be like always assessing what can go wrong. And when you have a winner, sometimes you've... You, you say, oh, that's, park it, it's done really well. But you always got to test your winners all the time, like daily, have, has anything changed? And with Blue Scope, in China, there's a lot of anti-dumping measures on steel. I think it was eight steel mills in China, that anti-dumping had rolled off, so they started bidding aggressively back into Australia. Blue Scope had a decision to make. Do they go with the... Do they t take a volume hit or do they drop their price? They drop their price and that's why you've got to downgrade. So, yeah, just when you have winners, make sure, you know, that thesis is still playing out and nothing's changed because it's easy to f forget about your winners because they're doing so well, but things can change quite quickly. That's great. Thanks, Matt. And, Jeff, just finally, in terms of the other listed investment companies that we hold in the portfolios, could you comment um, on those and also the... WAM capital takeover of Malopo for those that weren't here during mm. the AGM. Yeah, so um, so effectively, as I said earlier, we're trying to buy undervalued growth companies, uh, and whether they are in large cap, mid cap, small cap, or micro cap. That's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to buy them when we can see a catalyst that's going to change the valuation. Uh, and so we're really getting the maximum. You know, we're taking the least amount of risk and getting the maximum amount of return. Um, because we all know, you know sort of, you know, we've, we've all got our money in these funds and sort of rule number one is don't lose money. Rule number two is same as rule number one, which is the same as rule number three. 
So that's how we try to manage the money. Um, and in terms of, well, we're sitting in cash, and they can be very high levels of cash, then what we do is, because we're operating in the market, we take advantage of any opportunities that present themselves. And as Chris said, you know, more recently there's been some very good IPOs you know, that we might have liked on a research base or we, or we might have just believed we're going to make money out of them or, or blocks of stock or, or something like that. And in that part of the portfolio, you know, we're, we're more disciplined um, in terms of, uh, well, not more disciplined, we have a, a stop loss um, where if they fall more than 10% we sell. And that's because it was just a trade. We, um, sometimes you can look at trading, it's, it's, it's like you know, picking up dollar coins on a train track. Um, you know, occasionally you get hit, um, but you hope, hope you picked up enough dollar coins <laughs> on the way through. So it can be like that because you know, it's, it's high volume stuff. Um, and, and with that part of the portfolio, part of it is we, if we can buy assets at a discount. And that's where Malopo comes in, and I'll come back to that, but that's where the other listed investment companies come in. And we've got, I think, shareholdings, mainly you know, WAM Capital and WAM Active, um, have shareholdings in about you know, 14 or 15 other listed investment companies. Uh, and that's, that's listed investment companies that are traded, you know, you're buying, a, say, a dollar of assets for 80 cents. And what we normally do, we try to use, um, well, initially we try to use a carrot, uh, and in terms of explain what we think they need to do, um, you know, with their, say, dividend policies, communication policies, you know, shareholder engagement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then occasionally, you know, well, sometimes they pay attention, they do that, that, and they get the share price to NTA, and then we sell out and move on. Uh, and occasionally we've got to use a stick. Um, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, we prefer not to use a stick, but occasionally we do. Uh, in terms of Malopo specifically, the, I mean, that's just a... The, the only reason everyone's asking for about, it, about it is because we made a, a takeover bid, but really we would do that trade uh, every day if we could, um, and you wouldn't necessarily be aware of it. So you're effectively buying... You know, what, is, what is the play? Uh, Malopo... Um, has over, a little over 18 cents a share in cash assets, and we've bid 13 and a half, or WAM Capital's bid 13 and a half cents. So we're buying cash assets at a 70% discount. It also does have some oil and gas assets, which are worth about three cents a share. You know, if you add that on, um, and it has a, a a provision for a legal liability, um, and and I mean one of the side benefits Malopo ha has got. Is, um, is they have the ability to pay nearly a 14 cent fully frank dividend. So obviously that would be a, a major benefit. So it's really, it's just a discount asset play uh, and, and we've announced it as a takeover. Okay, that's th thank you, Jeff. So that actually concludes the formal part of the presentation and those that have tuned in uh, to the live streaming, thank you very much uh, for, for tuning in and we look forward to um, seeing you all again in six months.